probably beginning in October. However, the spread of production for the H1N1 vaccine is unexpectedly slow, especially considering the, un the anticipated volume that may be needed. And the oper operative word here is may. We don't know how much we will need. And there are many other things that we don't know as well. Safety of the H1N1 vaccine is also an issue. Potential side effects are not fully known, with volunteer testing set to begin in August. Finally, government surveillance of the impact and progression of the two simultaneous flu strains will be challenging and perhaps unprecedented. Consider the recent weekly progression of the H1N1 virus from surveillance reports by the CDC. Just one month ago, on June 25th, the CDC reported 27,717 confirmed probable H1N1 cases and 127 deaths in 53 territories and U.S. and, and 53 states and, and 53 states and U.S. territories. Just one month later, the CDC reported 43,771 confirmed probable H1N1 cases and 302 deaths. That's over 16,000 more cases of infections and a doubling in the number of deaths in just one month. This is indeed a challenging period with a lot of unknowns. In the next hour, we have the rare opportunity to dialogue with what we can probably call, with great safety, medical royalty. The most distinguished Sir Richard Feacham, MD, is the director of the Global Health Group at the University of California in San Francisco. Dr. Julie Gerberdeen, the former director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and my former boss, is most distinguished and we're most happy to have her here with us. We use the term leader sometimes a little uh, loosely, but it's not wasted in introducing the longtime director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Anthony Fauci. And our brilliant new Commissioner of the Feder of Food and Drug Administration and the Obama Administration, Dr. Margaret Hamburg. And finally, the director of the Johns Hopkins Malaria Research Institute and the 2003 Nobel Prize laureate, Dr. Peter Agri. Dr. I'm sorry, Sir Richard will begin with his two minute opening remarks on the global perspective <coughs> and wider pandemic context. Well, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Please, I'm looking the wrong way. Looking the wrong way. Don't let's look the wrong way with H1N1. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Linda, for the introduction. Um, my role is to briefly set uh, the global scene for thinking about H1N1 before we come to more detailed discussions about H1N1 in the United States. And of course, a pandemic by definition is a global epidemic. So to set the global scene is, I think, uh, a good way to start. And I want to make very briefly eight points about H1N1 in a global context. Firstly, the 21st century will be a century of pandemics. Some will be modest, some will be devastating. Together, they are very likely to cause far more deaths than all wars, all terrorism, all impact from global warming, or other horrors that you can imagine. This will be a big killer century for global pandemics. Second, they will be caused by viruses, and if they're not caused by viruses, they will be caused by bacteria that are resistant to very many antibiotics. Thirdly, some pandemics will be chronic, by which I mean that they will rise and decline over decades. Some pandemics will be acute, by which I mean they will rise and decline over months. Fourthly, we started the 21st century 20 years in, two decades, into a chronic pandemic, and not any chronic pandemic, but the largest pandemic in recorded human history having devastating impacts around the world 
Of course, I'm referring to H HIV AIDS. And that pandemic, which we are already now almost three decades into, has several decades yet to run. Fifth, we are also in the early years of an incipient chronic pandemic caused by multiply antibiotic resistant tuberculosis. It continues to grow and it will get much worse before we manage to contain it. Point six, we were watching closely H5N1 until H1N1 came along and we got distracted. We should continue to watch closely for H5N1 and indeed all other new flu strains. H5N1 fortunately remains primarily a bird virus today, but it has infected 436 humans to our knowledge, real number much higher, but we know of 436 human cases in 16 countries and 60% of those have died. And that's a very important fact because there are two properties in flu viruses which we are concerned about. And we're com particularly concerned where a particular virus has both of these properties. The first property is easy human to human transmission and the second pro property is a readiness to kill otherwise healthy people, a high case fatality rate. H5N1 clearly has the second property. It is very fatal, but it does not have yet the first property, easy human-to-human -human transmission. Point seven, we're now in the midst of H1N1, which we will concentrate on in this session. And in just 12 weeks, as Linda referred to, in just 12 weeks, it has got from Mexico to 160 countries. Now, there are only about 205 countries in the world, and in only three months, it's got from one, Mexico, to 159 others. That is a remarkable rate of spread, and that tells us that property number one, easy human-to-human -human transmission, is very much a property of H1N1. Fortunately, property number two, a high case fatality rate, is not yet, not at the present time, at all a property of H1N1. And we'll learn more from the other panelists about whether uh, we should be concerned about the acquiring of that high lethality, of that high case fatality rate, which it does not currently have. And lastly, on a global scale, I think we have to really emphasize that pandemic control is a global public good par excellence. There are no winners and losers globally in pandemics. We all win or we all lose. We all sink or we all swim. And the ability to contain, and if we fail to contain the ability to cope with pandemic, with pandemics, depends on a unique degree of global collaboration. And that global collaboration spans what I call the three Gs, from genetics and fundamental science through to global governance. And our global collaboration across that spectrum of the three Gs today is not in sufficiently good shape. Today, we cannot contain HIV AIDS illustrates that very well. H1N1 has just illustrated that uh, remarkably strongly. And having failed to contain, we will not cope adequately if we are faced with a virus, shall we say a flu virus, with both of the properties that I mentioned. And so globally speaking, we have a long way to travel to be prepared for the pandemics of the 21st century. Thank you very much. Dr. Gerberding. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on uh, Sir Richard's comments and present to you three important facts about influenza and influenza pandemics. And I'm also going to describe three very dangerous fictions about influenza pandemics. The first fact is, of course, that pandemics do happen and that in a world where pigs, poultry, and people 
have never been so close together in such high numbers in so many parts of the world. We can expect to see more emergence and more spread and more rapid spread as we've just seen how quickly even this H1N1 virus has moved around the world. A corollary of that is, of course, people will die. And it's not just going to be people in this country who will die. I spent a few days a couple weeks ago in South Africa uh, exercising with 17 other African nations on their pandemic preparedness plans. And while they are doing miraculous work to try to prepare, the most vulnerable people in the world aren't here in the U.S. They're in the part of the world that has the least resources and the least capacity to prepare for something like this. So health disparities will be uh, an important part of that fact. The second fact is that Mother Nature is an absolutely diabolical terrorist. And we need to always have a healthy respect for how unpredictable influenza is. Of all the things I experienced, and I experienced 43 public health emergencies while I was the CDC director, nothing was more full of surprises than influenza. We don't know whether this virus that we're dealing with right now will remain stable. We don't know if it will become more drug resistant. We don't know if it will remain vulnerable to the vaccine that we're making. We don't know if it would reassort if the seasonal virus, the H5 virus, or the new H1N1 virus infect the same person or the same pig, we could see an even more virulent or more deadly virus emerge. And we have to be prepared for all of those possibilities because Mother Nature has taught us that they can happen. The third fact is that preparedness really matters. I think we've seen already how our federal preparedness, our state preparedness, and our local preparedness has helped us get through the first wave of this H1N virus. Not perfectly, but many, many important steps, purchases, research, many, many important aspects of preparedness have put us in a much better position to deal with it. But we're not done yet, and we're only as strong as our weakest link. Now let me talk about the three most dangerous fictions. One really prevalent fiction is that we can vaccinate our way out of this problem, even if we have vaccine early in the fall. Well, I'm afraid that I am a person who takes issue with that perspective. Even if we had all the vaccine that we could possibly create, in the best year, influenza vaccine is certainly not 100% efficacious. It is not the best vaccine that we have. And we have a lot of evidence that in old people or immunosuppressed people and sometimes in very young people, influenza vaccine has very little protection. So we cannot rely on vaccine alone as our strategy. The second dangerous fiction is that the federal government can solve this problem. Now, I don't need to say too much more about that. I, I, I know um, at least some people here are probably from Louisiana and Katrina territory, but we know that the federal government cannot solve any complex problem alone. And we really do have to rely on the front line at the local level. And that is something that I believe has made enormous progress since Katrina and since the efforts for pandemic preparedness have received such a high national attention. But our front line is ill-equipped to deal with some of the most rudimentary aspects of the pandemic. And right now, we're particularly vulnerable because people have become very complacent. The final dangerous fiction that I'd like to emphasize is that our health care system is ready. Take a look at what's going on in Australia. They are experiencing significant numbers of H1N cases there right now. Not a big wave, but enough to fill their intensive care units and to absolutely bring their health care system right to the point where it is beginning to experience the overflow and the overload that a bad seasonal influenza year. We don't have to get very much worse than a bad seasonal influenza year to really tip our health system into an environment where we can't cope. Probably the most important lesson I learned in Africa was instead of our usual approach in the United States, which is to start at the critical care at the most intensive part of our system and kind of 
eventually get down, as, doc, as Senator Daschle, I almost called him Dr. Daschle, as Senator Daschle said to the bottom of the primary care pyramid, with flu and a seasonal, bad seasonal or a pandemic, we've got to fortify the non-health care part of our health delivery, the home care, the community care, and do everything we can to keep people in that environment, use our precious health care delivery resources for that part of our society, because it will be completely inefficient to use all of those resources in the intensive care environment. So we actually have to re invert our health care pyramid if we're going to cope with anything beyond a typical seasonal year. And now the man with the answers. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Linda. Uh, I've had the, uh, the, the privilege, the fun, and the excitement of sharing with Julie those dozens of health care uh, emergencies and issues that she had to deal with not necessarily on the front line, but as she would, as it were, get the football and lateral it to us to try and figure out if we could get a handle on the development of, of countermeasures. And that's what I'm going to use my few minutes talking to you about. And in fact, it, it happened that way. I was asked to talk about some of the research and research-related issues. The one thing I would like the, the audience to appreciate is that the, the response, the preparedness, and the implementation of a preparedness response is really a coordinated effort among multiple components of the federal government just within the Department of Health and Human Services, the working together of the CDC in the trenches on the front line with the NIH and the uh, Food and Drug Administration, as well as elements within the Department of Health and Human Services that are responsible for the procurement and the availability of vaccines are essential to getting the countermeasures that we need, albeit that they're not perfect, and I'll get back to that in a second, because in many respects, I agree with Julie that you can't rely on one single countermeasure, one single implementation of a pandemic preparedness and implementation plan. And that's the reason why it's got to be coordinated. Having said that, what happened, maybe this came through in the media or maybe not, but the CDC was right there uh, when things emerged in a very, very uh, subtle way, first in Mexico and then in the United States, or maybe the other way, we're not sure. But the first thing they did was to isolate the virus. And when they isolated the virus, they put it in a form that others could get it to grow and do things with it. And one of the first things they did was to give it to the scientists at the NIH to distribute to the people who have the greatest expertise in what we call the molecular signatures and the molecular fingerprints. I put that under the category of fundamental basic research. Why are these questions important? Well, they're important because we want to know, as this virus evolves and the CDC is tracking it, are there any molecular signatures that would alert us that this would become perhaps more virulent, or this would be more prone to affect a certain group of individuals, or more transmissible? You don't need a molecular screen to tell you that this is highly transmissible, so Richard just mentioned that, that it really is. In any event, those things are going on, and there's one thing that we're learning uh, about this virus with the big, big caveat is that we all say, those of us with experience with influenza, if there's one thing you could predict about influenza, it's that it's going to be unpredictable. There's no doubt about that. But having said that, we know that the virus that was isolated by the CDC very early on in April, and you look at the virus that's now not only in the United States through the schools, but in Argentina, in Australia, it's essentially, molecularly, exactly the same virus with very few changes, which is telling us that this has not, up to now, had a great deal of muta mutations that would change it. There's an evolutionary reason why this is so. When viruses thrust themselves into the population, if there's no immunity out there, there's no pressure for them to change. They see exactly what they want to see. They start to mutate when we put things in their way, drugs, immune responses, or what have you. However, they could spontaneously mutate even if there's no pressure on them. That's the thing I believe we're worried about, that it will change and become more virulent. Having said that, moving on to the issue of what else did the CDC do for us? They gave us and the FDA and the companies the seed viruses to grow pilot lots to ask some fundamental questions that we would like to know about this virus before we make the decision 
to embark upon a vaccination campaign. You've heard many times from officials at HHS that that decision has not been made. There's a number of reasons for that. We want to see what is going on, not only in our own country this summer, we see it now still in summer camps, but does it change a bit now that it's in the Southern Hemisphere? They're going through their winter right now. While they're doing it, two things are going on simultaneously. The companies are rearing up with tens and tens and tens of millions of doses. At the same time, we're going to ask a bunch of questions. Some of you may recall that just a couple of days ago on Wednesday, we made the announcement from my institute that we're embarking on a series of clinical trials among adults, elderly, and children to ask the following question. First, is it safe? Be careful of that safe issue, because when you think of safety of flu, you generally think of the chaos and catastrophe of 1976 when there was no pandemic, but there was Guillain-Barre toxicities or adverse events associated. What we're looking at now is not going to pick that up. We're looking at what we talk about fundamental, immediate type issues with injecting something into someone's arm. As important to that is what is the right dose? What is the right dosage regimen? Is it one dose of 15 mics or two doses of 15 mics? Is it one dose of 30 or two doses of 30? And should we give them sequentially? We're going to ask that in young adults and the elderly. If it looks reasonably safe early on, we're going to go into children. The other question that Walter asked me just a little while ago, when you go in, should you get your seasonal flu shot at the same time as you get your, quote, pandemic flu shot? We don't know whether giving them together is going to interfere, it's going to help, or what. So we're doing a study giving it before, during, and after. There are also special populations, pregnant women. There's people who are immunocompromised. We need to know how to administer it if the decision is made to administer it. Again, getting back to the Guillain-Barre, there is no clinical trial that has ever been performed that is going to tell us beforehand whether there's going to be Guillain-Barre, because you need to do hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So that's going to be what the CDC will be doing, is very strict surveillance of people who have been vaccinated to see that that's the case. Do we have reason to believe that this will be okay vis-a-vis -vis the safety and the immunogenicity? And the answer is the same companies who've been making the seasonal flu every year for us, seasonal flu vaccine, the same processes, the same plants, they're making this. So this is not considered by the FDA, and I'll leave that for Peggy to, 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 uh, to expound on, as, quote, a brand new vaccine. It's a seasonal strain change, not a seasonal, a strain change, which, in fact, we want some information about, but we don't need to treat it like a new vaccine. Now, someone, I think you mentioned about the timetable. Yeah. The warning that I say, because uh, 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 Julie and I can show you some scars that we have <laughs> about saying the exact date when something is going to be ready when you're dealing with biologics. We hope to have it ready by a certain date. I'm not 100% certain that we're going to. I think we will, but there's no guarantee about that. I'll stop there and we'll have some questions. Uh, Dr. Hamburg is going to speak with us about the availability of vaccine, which really seems to be okay. a big, big question at this well, stage. Well, actually, almost everything I planned to say, Tony just said. <laughs> <laughs> I used to work for Tony. I should know better than to ever agree to, uh, to follow him. But, uh, but let, me, let me just elaborate a little bit and underscore some of the points that have already been made. Um, you know, we are all watching the evolution of the H1 and one pandemic with great interest and concern for all of the reasons uh, that have been outlined. We really want to do the best job we can in anticipating what we'll experience in the coming months with all of the unknowns. And we really want to make sure that we have the best possible set of tools in our armamentarium to respond to protect uh, the health of the, the public. That includes both uh, drugs and vaccines as well as um, other public health strategies for containment and control. Um, really, there's sort of four pillars to the, the strategy that the, um, the federal government uh, is undertaking at the present time. Really a very active surveillance to be able to identify what's going on and track um, the, the pandemic and the experience. Uh, in other parts of the world, importantly, including the Southern Hemisphere, which is now experiencing its flu season. Strategies for community mitigation, prevention and control um, through, through public health measures, 
um, vaccine preparation as well as antivirals, and um, Julie is right that we can't vaccinate our way out of this, but it's a, it's a very important uh, tool. And then a communication strategy as well, because it's going to be key to our success in implementing whatever strategies uh, we put in place to be able to communicate it clearly and to really make sure that, that the public, individuals and families and communities understand what we're doing and why and are prepared to engage with us um, to, uh, to put in place the programs and policies um, that we feel are most needed to address the problems. So putting on my FDA hat, and it's still very new to me, um, this is, I mean, my second month on the job, uh, but uh, I was asked to talk a little bit about um, the vaccine and antiviral issue and, and what can we anticipate. I'm, I'm going to avoid the trap that, that Tony and Julie know well of, of giving uh, numbers or, or timetables, um, but just underscore really a couple things that Tony already said. Obviously, a key goal with respect to vaccine is to have as much as possible available as soon as possible, but that has to be balanced with making sure that we do the best possible job with respect to safety and efficacy. It's a stepwise approach, and I think it's important to underscore that the decision-making about producing the vaccine is delinked from how we will use it. We want to make sure that we have vaccine that we can use when and if we need it. But simply because we've made vaccine, that doesn't mean that we're going to use it. I think that was part of the problem with the 1976 <laughs> swine flu, um, what some people call fiasco, where there was no continuing outbreak, but we had a lot of vaccine and used it, and then it ended up having uh, complications because we thought, well, it can't hurt. Um, and right now, very serious discussions are underway about what will the vaccine strategy look like and sort of trying to look at different scenarios, um, whether to vaccinate, who to target, um, what dose to give, and, and a lot depends on how the epidemic evolves. But as Tony said, uh, NIH is doing clinical studies, <laughs> industry is doing clinical studies. Uh, we're trying to, to uh, get the data that we need to address dose dosing schedule, and also the important question of whether or not adjuvant, which is, is something that can be added to a vaccine to boost immune response, um, might be, be used. And also looking at the question of the safety of using and efficacy of using H1N1 um, pandemic vaccine with seasonal vaccine. But we have to start making decisions now, even though all of the data isn't in. And there is a, a great deal of experience with our seasonal uh, flu vaccine, um, both uh, experience with the manufacturing procedures as well as with uh, the safety uh, of that vaccine. Um, so, I, you know, I, I, I would have to underscore that the decisions are still underway, but we would be able to, to comfortably license an H1N1 uh, pandemic strain uh, vaccine using the strain change criteria and the existing experience. Um, and there's a lot to be said about having a licensed vaccine available for the, for the public uh, come fall and winter. Uh, but we, we recognize that um, we may need to make some changes along the way. I think the manufacturers are being as flexible as possible, working with us to, to understand that while we may make up a vaccine, we may change how we want to use it. We may change the dosing schedule, and we may change uh, whether or not adjuvant is used as more information is, is uh, becoming available. But manufacturers are now busy preparing vaccine. There are five manufacturers preparing vaccine for the United States. Unfortunately, as Linda mentioned, the, the yield hasn't been quite what we would have hoped compared to our experience with seasonal flu vaccine. Um, but we're, we're, we're up and going, and, and, um, and we expect that we will have, have vaccine available uh, come the middle of the, the fall. We've kept open the issue of adjuvant. Maybe I'll just say a word about that, um, because I think it's, it's, it's an important issue. It's one that, that people don't fully understand, and frankly, it's one that makes me a little bit queasy because the United States is, is heading in a different direction than our counterparts in Europe, and the implications of our decision-making um, 
have broader uh, impact in terms of global supply. So I, I, I think it's important uh, to just say a word about this. As I mentioned, the adjuvant is, is something that can be added to a vaccine. It can be either added at the time of administration or it can be added into the vaccine preparation. But it does allow you to do what we call antigen spare, uh, to, to use available um, vaccine and extend it. But the, in the United States, we have very little experience with adjuvanted uh, vaccine, and, and the world has, has very little experience with H1N1 adjuvanted vaccine. Uh, the FDA has never licensed an adjuvanted flu vaccine. There's, there are some safety concerns. Um, and so we are really looking very carefully at the available data uh, worldwide, working with our partners around the world, and also looking at the data that will emerge from Tony's studies and, and others. And as I mentioned, we have a sort of a, a dynamic decision making where if there are shifts in terms of the, um, the what we understand about the, the H1N1 uh, virus that circulated, if it's not as immunogenic as, as, um, as we hope, um, we might move towards adjuvant if, if there's evidence of genetic drift and, and uh, concern that, that the vaccine we're preparing might not be as effective with this changing virus, then the adjuvant might add a broader protection and, and so we might move in that direction. Thank and you, importantly, you. okay, if increased virulence, then we'll, we'll add adjuvant as okay. well. So, sorry. No, no. Too much okay. to talk about. No, but we want to leave time for questions and I'm sure there will be some on the vaccine. Dr. Ivory, please. Well, I'm a newcomer to this infectious disease world and I'm very impressed with the, the company here on the panel. I guess like everyone here, I've had influenza several times and like perhaps some here, I've been accused of being a swine. <laughs> but to the best of my knowledge, I've never had swine flu, and I hope I don't. But it might give uh, some protection against <laughs> Well, there's always a good side, right? Four million Americans will die next year, no matter what we do, in terms of national health leadership. It's a fact. Say that again? Four million Americans. Well, there's 300 million people, average lifespan of 70, do the math. So four million people will die next year, and about 1% will die of seasonal flu. So we're looking at a problem. But I think we have to take it in perspective. This may rise to a higher level. There are reasons to be concerned. But I think we should just maybe take this in the perspective of what we know about pandemics. And in the um, history of medicine, pandemics have occurred when at times of great migrations of populations, Spanish flu following World War I, great refugee populations. Uh, the time of the Hajj every year, there's a concern of cholera outbreaks in the, the Middle East. Um, and events such like the World Cup event next year, it, it's, a, it's a potential hazard. Um, oftentimes pandemics um, turn out to be large-scale problems with surprises, and uh, I think in the past generally there are no quick fixes. An example of the cholera epidemic that swept through Southeast Asia, South Asia in the 1970s. Um, good therapies for oral rehydration of cholera were developed. It's a horrible diarrheal disease. It seems to be under control. Bangladesh, one of our poorest countries, to protect its citizenry because cholera has passed through the Vibrio bacteria that live in the surface water, put in tube wells to take groundwater. But being a poor country without the resources, it turns out that 50 million Bangladeshis are now drinking groundwater with no cholera but toxic levels of arsenic. So this is a time for wisdom, I think wise choices, and putting things in perspective. The same thing with malaria. I direct the Malaria Research Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. A generation ago, malaria was, was on the ropes. DDT, chloroquine, it was under control. The nation of Ceylon, now known as Sri Lanka, had malaria completely eliminated. And then, of course, the removal of DDT, the resistance to chloroquine, it's back with vengeance. So we have to be concerned, but I think we should not be panicky. And I think this is where a as a physician, with, without the expertise of my distinguished colleagues, I'd just like to put in a word for um, some, some caution. And uh, I think it'd be important if the lay press and our political leaders deferred to those in the know, and that panel members being individuals such as this, who have great backgrounds of information at the CDC, the National Institutes of Health, the, the Center for Vaccine Development, NIH, 
the FDA, because uh, I, I think uh, national calm is in order. We are facing something, but this is not insurmountable. And I think pro proper uh, uh, approaches are being taken, and we will deal with this. Tony, am I right? You're right. Thanks. As usual. No. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I want to open it up to questions. And you'll be first, Nancy. <laughs> I want to ask one real quick, quick question sure. just before you. Um, having heard the, the level of concern that's been expressed here, what are the chances that we'll have no problem with H1N1 and that it won't come back, it won't reemerge in the fall? Or is that wishful thinking? Well, it's wishful thinking, I think, in my opinion. Uh, we have uh, still a rather significantly large naive population that has no immunity to it. The CDC had estimated that about a million people, probably more, they're probably, you know, they're usually right on the money, but probably more people have been infected. That leaves a mm -hmm. lot mm -hmm. other people. The yes. latest estimate was that between two to six plus percent of the population may have been infected. Uh, it seems like the older individuals, probably because of immunity they had to previous exposures to similar viruses or perhaps to previous immunizations, make them less susceptible than younger people. Having said that, if the virus is still in summer camps and we're having breakouts in summer camps and in military installations, the virus is still here. The chances when the weather gets cool and you put children in school of this not happening is, I think, as a infectious disease guy, really, really small. Now, you know, the problem is, I'm glad you asked that question. One of the things you gotta be careful, when people ask people questions, particularly people in government, it's very difficult to give you a real understandable answer because you're afraid you wanna cover your butt here and do that, but the fact is, my opinion is that it's gonna come back. I hope if it comes back, it comes back in the same relatively mild mm -hmm. to moderate way that we're seeing it. But I can't imagine as an infectious disease doc, if it's breaking out in summer camps now, that when kids go back to school, that it's not gonna come back. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it hasn't gone away. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nancy? I have to applaud the CDC and the NIH and the FDA, because I think you guys have been so on message as this evolved in real time. And I think we really watched it globally in real time, which is what scared people and was sort of exciting you know, as, as scientists. But how do you take the message in to the responsibility issue talk about people who insist on prophylaxis and panel flu, when we should quarantine people and the craziness when it doesn't make sense. And how do you talk people into using a vaccine when people, frankly, don't make use of the regular seasonal vaccine? And to anyone. Well, we can start with, um, you already heard from, from Peggy that communication is one of the four pillars. and. Um, for at least four years, we've been trying to answer those questions by getting as much information ahead of time to try to understand what people might do, think, and why they think and do what they say they're going to do. One of those um, exercises has involved sitting down with regional media. I don't know if you participated in one, Nancy, but we, we had uh, around the country to bring the um, media in, the local television stations, the radio stations, the people who would actually be the middleware for delivering the messages between public officials and the citizens, because this is going to be one of those times where we need to all be on the same message, not just the feds and the state and locals, mm -hmm. but the media needs to be supporting getting the right information out. Um, after anthrax attacks, some very important polls were done about who Americans listen to, and who they prefer to get this kind of information from. And they first looked at all the federal officials, including the CDC director, uh, which was Dr. Copeland by the time, and by the way, most people preferred federally to get their information from Dr. Copeland, more than the Surgeon General or the Secretary of Homeland Security or the FBI director. But um, they really most preferred to get information from their doctor, their own doctor. And so I think this is gonna be one of those times when getting that message into the health system and allowing the trusted, most credible person in most people's lives to be the helpful decision maker, the advocate, is gonna be absolutely critical to our success. Yeah, that, it's really a very difficult problem. It is the same uh, philosophical rationale, if you wanna call it that, that leads to multiple uh, drug-resistant uh, microbes with antibiotics is that physicians 
feel they need to respond to the concerns of the patient and they give antibiotics when they shouldn't be giving antibiotics, it's very clear that the CDC is saying if you have a child who gets the flu, you should not prophylax the rest of the class. If you're in an institution where you have immunocompromised, a nursing home, that's a different story. But to immuno, excuse me, to prophylax a normal, healthy young person with no, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And yet, people are doing it right now. You know, the only other thing I would add is that there's a real value in, in talking about this stuff in between crises, because that's right. when people can most productively listen and learn. That's also, they don't care as much, so, you know, they, they may get distracted by the <laughs> other, you know, crisis of the day. But, you know, there's always this balance between you don't want to panic people about something that may not happen. On the other hand, to talk through some of the issues, work with the media to get critical messages out, and to, to try to sort of lay the groundwork when people are not responding to a, a situation that's unfolding right in their community is of real value. And, and I'm sorry, just the idea of quarantining, I mean, people can't stop playing with each other, because it seems like the horses are barn. We, we face that because we get people of, of good faith, particularly in the Congress, who keep asking us that. Why don't you close the borders and not let people in place? Once it's here, it's here. It's here. It's here. Okay, and Sir Richard so nicely emphasized for us that in a very short period of time, it went from California, Mexico to 160 countries. Another question? Oh boy. <laughs> I'm going to take that nice lady in the back, then I'm going to move forward. Uh, so we just talked about how we might have a perfect storm with alert, police, president, and H1N1 with uh, the pandemic being both highly transmissible and very lethal. Um, can any of you tell us, you know, in a dish, have we grown these two together? Have we become H1N1 witnesses and put together? We're all worried about what might happen when these two combine. Well, the data have been published um, putting in the dish H5, the, the, the avian virus and the seasonal H1N virus, and it was QED. Right. It wasn't hard to do, so I don't right. think it's going to be difficult. Right. The, I, that has been published yeah. yet. No, yeah, but the, the, the interesting thing that, and it's complicated, I'll try to make it very simple. Even if you can exchange genes, th th there is not a one single gene expression phenomenon. It's a combination of things between the host's adaptability and the virus's adaptability so that you might put the right genes and in a dish you have something that has the gene of transmissibility with the gene of virulence and yet that is not a fit virus and it's not going to infect anybody. The studies that were done from some of Julie's people at the CDC who did it not with the H1N1, but did it, as you said, with the seasonal, there were so many permutations of that that you got just what you want. Ah, this is it. The Andromeda strain, only it, could, it didn't infect it. You put two ferrets in the same cage, and they weren't infecting each other. It was easy to do. I mean, no doubt, you could switch those genes around really easily. That doesn't mean that we're not concerned about it. We're concerned about everything. I think most, most people would say there's no barrier in right. nature to that happening. Exactly, habit. exactly. Well, you know, it, it's the Department of Health and Human Services, I think, very wisely has, as part of their pandemic plan, has made a major investment with companies to be making year, eggs all year round so that you could actually have a greater production capacity. It is a combination of the availability of eggs, but also the availability of production capacity because, you know, up until most recently, the production capacity for the whole world was less than a billion doses. Now they're projecting, and you've got to be careful when you read the numbers with or without adjuvant, that it's anywhere from one to two to a four few. And a half. Yeah, four and a half with adjuvant. But uh, it's still, uh, uh, and I think 
Julie very wisely said that if you look at a global pandemic, you, you absolutely need a vaccine, but a vaccine is not gonna be the answer to it. And it's one of the reasons is that you can't possibly vaccinate everybody. The So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, it's a, it's a dedicated supply. Yeah, it's a dedicated but, but the other point that I want to make is that, you know, we also, we're in this for the long term, right. and we need to be also investing, and, and it's begun, yeah. but we need to really strengthen the efforts in next generation vaccines. We don't really want to have a, a flu vaccine system that's based on availability eggs. of eggs. For one thing, you could get a strain of flu that actually kills the eggs, and right. then you're cooked, right. so to speak. Um, well, so, <laughs> so, you know, the, the importance of, of really um, taking advantage of the science that exists today and, and developing new vaccine right. strategies that will both be uh, safer in terms of uh, being able to produce uh, vaccines and the numbers that we might need, and also probably quicker uh, in terms of, and more nimble, and maybe more broad in their protection. So yeah, that's what we need to look at. Yeah. The, the, there, there are some companies working on yeah. that. There are two <laughs> things. Companies are trying to make cell-based, in other words, they can grow it in cells. Everyone knows that we made a major investment. But also, you know, in, in our institute, Gary Nabel, who's somewhere in the back there is at the Vaccine Research Institute, is looking at those next generation DNA vaccines, vectored vaccines. Those are the kind of things you really need. That's 21st century technology. Eggs have been very good to us over the years. It's time to put them to bed, as it were. And just to put a plug in here, you know, it's embarrassing that we have a flu vaccine made in eggs. It's completely embarrassing. That technology is so outdated. But we have been so complacent about influenza. The fact that 35,000 people die from it every year just seems to kind of slip by, like right. that's not really important. And so what is good about the attention on the pandemic is that it's going to get us a better flu vaccine for seasonal flu. And that's important because we know we'll save lives then. Let's take another question. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the urban medicine folks lately about this H1N1 is that you should get it now because it will be worse later. And I know people have actually tried to get kids exposed. Right. Uh, what are your considered comments? <laughs> Real bad idea. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a real bad idea. It isn't like chicken pox because the thing that is disturbing to all of us is that we are seeing, we saw it in Mexico, we're seeing it a bit, in, not a bit, maybe more than a bit, in, uh, in Argentina uh, and Australia that there are a, you know, a small number, but not a lot, but they're there, of otherwise healthy young people, not immunocompromised who are getting influenza, who are getting really sick to the point of needing respiratory support and even dying. So that happens only rarely. It may be an, a denominator number. It's just that so many people are getting infected that there isn't any greater incidence of it. You're just seeing it more because more people are getting infected. But I can tell you that is not a good idea to try and expose yourself to a potentially lethal virus in order to get immunity. But, you know, it's an important natural experiment. And I think that we need, as we move forward, to be asking questions and examining data and learning from the experience that we're in the midst of, whether it's um, doing the, the post-marketing surveillance of the vaccine and, and adverse you know, consequences, or understanding better um, how certain public health interventions like quarantine actually work in the real world setting, or you know, learning more about um, natural immunity. But I don't remember any Well, the second wave of the 1918 yeah. flu and the 1957 flu were more yeah. virulent. Yeah, I have to, uh, let me interject, this is my favorite subject, because we, <laughs> <laughs> we better be careful about saying that the first wave was a, the H1N1 of 1918 that changed. We've sequenced the summer and the winter wave, nobody has sequenced the first wave. So we don't know what that first wave is. So even though it's, it's now in the textbooks and in the books, you know, first wave, second wave, molecularly, we don't know that. 
we obviously need to prepare, even if we didn't have the historical perspective of first wave, second wave, we need to prepare for this turning into a much more virulent virus. But you know, there, there is not a documented molecular uh, uh, precedent for that from the standpoint of looking at sequences. This virus just changed at this mutation and became more virulent. Let's take another question here. Yes. In, uh, in the 1970s, the rest of the rest of the world. Can you speak up a bit? Oh, in the 1970s, the rest of the world was uh, isolated from the capitalists. Here recently, uh, a similar form is emerging in the Philippines, in swine, and being transmitted to people. And apparently, the rest of the world. And in between, we have the horrific strains of Africa. So I'm, I'm wondering uh, about the potential for change there and a pandemic for that particular virus. And uh, also, I'm curious whether our preparations for Well, it, thank you for the question. I'm not sure everyone in the back heard that, but um, it was a question about Ebola virus um, and how worried we should be about an Ebola pandemic and whether a focus on H1N1 is distracting us from other potential pandemics. Um, the general answer I would give is that, as I said at the beginning, I think the 21st century will be a century of viral pandemics, and they will continually surprise us, and they will come you know, from different animal reservoirs, and they will be different classes of virus. But the two properties coming together that will form the pandemic potential are the easy human-to-human -human transmission and the high case fatality rates in otherwise healthy infected humans. It's the combination of those two things, whether it's flu or whether it's something else, that we most are concerned about. What I detect in the world is riding on the back of HIV AIDS, which globally we did very little about for the first 20 years. We sat on our hands for 20 years on HIV AIDS, and then we got serious. But HIV AIDS, then SARS, then H5N1, then H1N1, has had the reverse effect of the one that you're concerned about. It has mobilized much greater effort internationally in the business of surveillance in the business of finding very early emerging viruses with pandemic potential or with pandemic concern associated with them and investigating those in great detail as quickly as we can. We're still not anywhere near good enough at doing that globally, but we're much better at doing it today with a lot of CDC and NIH pushing and... Uh, USDA. Yeah, yeah. Um, with a lot of pushing and, and, and shoving from the US, which was badly needed, the world is far more woken up to the need for good surveillance globally. This one came out of Mexico. Most flu strains come out of China, Vietnam, Indonesia. It, you just mentioned Ebola from, from, from the Philippines. This surveillance needs to be everywhere, and it needs to be a remarkable degree of collaboration, because we've got to share strains ship strains around the world to highly specialized laboratories and characterize them very quickly. We're getting better at that, but we're not halfway yet to where we need to be. We have five more minutes, and we'll try and get two or three more questions in. Please. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, my question is about antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, and the whole question of Well, it's an easy, it's an easy perspective. If you use a drug, you lose it um, because the bacteria evolve so much faster than we can evolve new drugs. So it's a really a question of how long does it take for drug resistance to emerge, not if drug resistance will emerge. And so any unnecessary use is an unnecessary question. I would leave it to yeah. Peggy to talk about the food supply because that's an FDA perspective. Well, it, you know, it is, it's a major concern in terms of all the different places um, where antibiotics are used and, and, 
again, you know, coming back to the appropriate use, actually FDA broke new ground just uh, two weeks ago uh, saying that we believe that uh, the uh, non-therapeutic use of antibiotics in animal feed for, for growth promotion um, is not judicious and should should be avoided. Um, but it's, it, we were met with a lot of pushback from industry. Um, and, uh, you know, it's an area of great contention because in both uh, agriculture and in aquaculture, the uh, raising of, of fish, uh, antibiotics are used in very large degrees. In fact, I think, Julie may know the numbers better than I, but I think that 70% of the antibiotics used around the world are used in yeah. agriculture yeah. and agriculture. So it's really quite astounding. In, but in, I think wait. In, in all communities, both <coughs> healthcare practice and animal health, uh, we need to make sure that, that antibiotics are used when needed and uh, as indicated and uh, realize that they're a very precious resource. We also need to help stimulate industry yeah, but that's, uh, to yeah, produce that's new, the, yeah, new that's uh, the problem. antibiotics. The problem, the, the, the you, you use, you lose, is exactly the reason why industry doesn't want to get involved in making new antibiotics. If you can count on one hand the number of new, really new antibiotics you've had over the years, because if you're going to invest in a new drug, it's several hundred million dollars. And if you're going to have a drug that's used in for seven days, ten days, or two weeks, not by a lot of people, and you know after a couple of years there's going to be resistance, you'd rather get a new Lipitor or a new anti-blood pressure medicine rather than an antibiotic. That's the problem. Right. I'm Go ahead. Just that, that statement seems, seems um, it's giving quite, quite weak. I mean, a warning industry not, you know, against against overuse, I mean, isn't it, and, and the fact that you're getting pushback from, from a statement that's so mild as that, that. Well, it is surprising. It is surprising, and I would have to say that, um, you know, most public health and medical groups have long supported this position. Um, uh, the, the National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine, the American Medical Association, the American Public Health Association, the Infectious Disease Society of America, the American uh, ASM, American Society for Microbiology, um, you know, the list, the list is long, um, uh, but, uh, you know, there, there are huge economic interests in terms of, of, of the use of antibiotics uh, in animal husbandry, and, and so, you know, our making this statement was a step, it wasn't, it wasn't a radical statement at all, but it was the first time that the FDA had come forward uh, with this position, and then what really matters is what happens as we move forward, because simply saying it doesn't make it so. So we need to work, there is a bill on the Hill that's being considered um, with respect to this issue, and, and at some point, you know, there will be um, legislative action or other um, actions, I think, to, to start to, to take a more responsible approach to antibiotic use. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more question, but just let me say that there will be a session tomorrow with Dr. Gerberding, Dr. Hamburg, and with Dr. David Kessler, the former FDA commissioner who just joined us on this whole issue of food safety, 1045 tomorrow morning. Who gets the last question? Who raises their hand? This nice lady here. <laughs> You're moving into constitutional questions. <laughs> if anybody knows how to you didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. It feels like we're often playing catch up on the kind of hysterical stories that take on that, that color, and especially when it just seems like there's more kind of anti immigrant sentiment than usual these last couple of years. So I just feel like we're in a, a wonderful little peak of this. Well, I, I think there's a very important issue you raise, and, and you know, local news outlet 
having a, an urgent story child has H1N1 flu and then develops epilepsy. Therefore, you know, epilepsy is caused by flu and, and you know, it, it does produce panic. And, you know, we can't bridle the media. On the other hand, I think it, it is good for responsible journalists to take the sources seriously. And I think that's really our, our government leaders should be given the opportunity to speak to the public. The public will respond. Most It's always possible to trick people into some fear, but uh, th 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 it's counterproductive. Absolutely yeah. important point. Nancy's sitting here, and I'm not saying this just because Nancy's in the audience, but I, I do have to say that the major networks and radio um, health um, leaders, the, the reporters that have the bona fide role of being the health, um, usually physicians, not always, um, have been incredibly responsible. And so getting that group of people to assess the veracity of some of these claims that will be popping up inevitably, there's nothing we're going to be able to do about that. But these trusted media medical personnel mm -hmm. are going to be particularly important mm -hmm. in putting that into perspective because they'll set the tone right. and they will really make a difference. There, there will be vaccine, you know, when vaccinations occur, Guillain-Barre happens rarely, but it happens unrelated to anything that has to do with vaccines all the time. Pregnant women have miscarriages. People have heart attacks. People have heart attacks. <laughs> so then you're talking about real how do we get the media to be responsible? The easiest way to derail a program is to have a vaccination campaign that's really essentially safe, to have somebody get a natural, instead of saying, what is the possibility, what is the probability of somebody walking out of an office, you know, and this happening? And the chances are, if you look at all of the data, it may have absolutely nothing at all. And that's one of the problems that vaccinations have in all of the issues that we have with children getting vaccinated. So there really needs that responsibility on the part of the media. Just to be clear, though, I know we've run out of time. It's really not the journalists being very panicked and concerned about. It's the point of yeah. fingers at the, the stigma. stigma. Yeah, the stigma, the absolutely. Yeah. Which I fear is very, very much important. Yeah. Right, you're that right. That was a terrible tragedy of SARS. You yeah. couldn't go into a Chinese restaurant and find other people eating right. there. Right. And, you know, that, that has been part of the preparedness of of also uh, finding the right spokespersons within communities that would be vulnerable to that kind of stigma to engage them in creating messages and all the all the efforts that are underway. But I, you know, I, I think again the credibility of the people setting the tone is going to be extremely important in combating that kind of stigma. And leaders, local political leaders, really have an important role to play. Also, in SARS, it was go to the restaurant and have dinner. But you know, it really does take. It's asking a lot of people to be able to not misplace their fears on those people over there, because that's a natural way that we all have of coping with fear and anxiety. And uh, could I could I come in very briefly, Linda? Please. And perhaps to take that a step further, I mean, if we if we focus on H1N1, two possibilities. One is it stays as it is. It does not become more virulent uh, than it is at the moment, in which case the world will go through an event next winter that is not particularly remarkable um, in relation to seasonal flu. The other possibility is that H1N1 does change and case fatality rates go up a lot in the worst case scenario. Now, if that happens, come back to my 205 countries in the world and stop to think where all the deaths are going to be. In the 50 or so better organized and more wealthy countries in the world, there will be millions of deaths in that eventuality, but not tens of millions. And there will be a degree of coping which will put a lid on the catastrophe. But in the remaining 150 countries, None of that will be true. There will not be high vaccination rates. There will not be widespread availability of Tamiflu or other antiretroviral drugs. There will not be a health system that is remotely able to cope as the sickness and death spreads. And there we're going to be looking at tens of millions of deaths. So the world will be very unequal next winter if we have an evolved and highly virulent H1N1 with the wealthy countries getting through it okay, uh, but the rest of the world not at all. We, we could, could readily expect tens of millions of deaths. 
And that consciousness of our position and other people's position, as we think about distribution of vaccine stocks, as we think about assistance to other countries to do what they are struggling to do, but we find easier to do at home, those issues, I think, are really important. We've gone over our time, but I think you will agree with such a rich panel, it was inevitable that we would. <laughs> Dr. Hamburg, Dr. Aubrey, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Nervous, you're right up in Baltimore. That's right. Thank you. 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 Thank you.